technology is not always my friend. But you know who is my friend? The guy that's right here, Herb Riker. So, Herb was my... Um, we did it, or we, Steve did it. I did it, uh, sort of, yeah. Anyway. Yes! <laughs> the sixth anniversary show at last. It's so great to have Herb with me. Six years of doing this show. 57 million views. Wow. I checked this morning. That's it, kind of mind-bending. It, it says that there's... Uh, 1,300 videos or 1,400 videos, that's not true. There's actually a lot more than that. I don't know where that goes. But anyway, there's a lot of it. And now you guys are watching, and that counts as another view. But it isn't just about view. It's really about having fun with audio, me being uh, sort of the expert here, the reviewer. You're, you're a guide, let's put it that way. So, and oh, before I forget, I do want to do an extra special shout-out to my patrons Thank you guys for not the whole six years, maybe five of the six years. Uh, the, one of the reasons that this channel has been able to continue is thanks to all of my patrons who have ever been my patrons for the whole time. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, guys. But to start this thing, uh, just the other day, I was listening to Rick Rubin has an amazing podcast called Broken Records. And they were rerunning an older episode where he interviewed Robbie Robertson. Who from the, he just passed away, and he was in the band called The Band. And he told this little story, and it is about, I was telling her about this before, about subjective listening or subjective opinions about sound. So anyway, the first, that, that uh, band record, the one with the brown cover, uh, that was recorded at Sammy Davis Jr.'s a pool house <laughs> in L.A. Sammy Davis was not present for the sessions. Anyway, so it was kind of like a, a field recording, you know, back to basic, super simple way of making the record. They make the record there. All, the whole record is recorded in that, in that pool house. And then um, he had to take it to get it uh, mixed. So he finds the best mixer around. He likes this guy. They seem to be on the same uh, schedule here. And the guy does the mix, and then when Robbie Robertson hears the mix, he's like, no way, this is completely wrong. I, I hate the sound of this record. And the guy was like, you know, a really prominent mixer. So anyway, Robbie says, I'm just going to mix it myself. So he mixes it to sound the way he wants it to sound. Now he has to get it mastered, and he goes to a legendary mastering engineer, Bob Ludwig. Bob Ludwig takes the, gets the tapes a couple days later, uh, Robbie goes to listen, and he does the same thing. He destroys the sound of the recording. He says, you guys are amateurs. You don't know what you're doing. You made a terrible sounding record, and I hope, Bob Ludwig is saying this to Robbie Robertson, I hope I can save your record because it's so terrible. And, and Robbie's saying, well, yeah, do, it, do, do what you do. But anyway, but Robbie's thinking, yeah, maybe I really did screw up. I think the, the master tapes sound like, well, the, the session tapes sound like what I want them to sound like, but maybe these guys are smarter than me or no more, they have more experience, and I made a totally screwed up record. So he's like, he's doubting himself. And then, this is why I'm telling you the story that leads up to this. Bob Ludwig calls him a couple days later and says, I was completely wrong. He said it was unusable, terrible. He said, Bob Ludwig was saying, no, this is actually really good. This is one of the best recordings I've ever heard. He, so he went from saying, this is junk, this is amateur hour, to saying, this sounds exceptionally good. That's really interesting. So in other words, here's this mastering engineer. He's got the ears, right? And he hears something, and he doesn't get it at first. It took a while for it to sink in, and then he was totally on board. So I'm a subjective uh, reviewer. Uh, people who buy audio are listening, usually subjectively, to the stuff that they buy. The pros, recording engineers, mix engineers, mastering engineers, it's all subjective. We like what we like. And we, I guess what we're doing is rationalizing why we like what we like. I mean, there's this... You know, what's interesting, though, is Rob, is, he has in his mind, mm. this is what... I want it to sound like, or I hope it hope it will right, sound right, like. Right, right, right. But he's never probably actually heard the sound that he's looking for on someone else's record. Right. So he doesn't say, "Well, I'll make it sound like you know Sam right. Cooke or something right, right, like that." Right, right. He has 
something in his mind. Uh -huh. And that to me is kind of the magic. And he's willing to kind of go with that thing he has in his mind. Like, I'm going to move forward with this and I'm going to make decisions on behalf of the band even. Right. Based on something in my mind. Well, I really respect because that. The other thing is that Robbie not only was the uh, composer of a lot of the songs and played guitar, he was also the engineer on some of the tracks. So he, from the get-go, had a vision as to what this recording was going to sound like. And then the mixing guys totally messes with that, and then Bob Ludwig was about to mess with it. So it's like getting everybody on the same page. But I, I think everybody, whether you're a mastering engineer or an audiophile or a reviewer, you do bring your own agenda to what the sound is of this thing that you're, you, you, play, you buy a record, you like the band, you take the, you get the rec recording, I should say, home, and it either is, lines up with your expectations, yeah, oh, I love the sound of this record, or you're like, I don't know, this isn't, this isn't working for me, right, or shades in between. And that's that whole subjective thing. And there are plenty of recordings that I've bought in my life that I went through changes on. You know, like first, I really liked the, re the sound of the recording. Then I didn't like the sound. Then I liked it again, you know. And by the way, in this interview with Robbie Robertson, he mentions um, Sly and the Family Stone, there's a riot going on, which was also a rather un unconventional and not immediately appreciative recording for its sound quality. It has a kind of weird muffled, stilted sound, but actually once you get past that, it, it actually sounds pretty cool. But that was Sly Stone's idea for what that record was. It's very early use of drum machines, by the way. And now I, I love it. I really, really do like that, that Sly record. So yeah, we evolve. The recording itself, other than masterings and stuff, is the same as it was. Like my version, my LP of the band, the one with the brown cover, is the one I bought in 1969. So and you can it, feel it when yeah, you touch it. Yeah, it's got some weight to it. And uh, so this is uh, Robbie's original version of what this record should sound like, his vision, I should say, for what the record should sound like. I don't want to get off on this too much of a tangent, but I just thought it would be a good way to start because what we like individually is our taste, what we are searching for, at least at this part of the journey. And I think that that's really, really interesting. What Robbie Graff. I'm gonna. You can talk for a little bit. I'm gonna check something over here. What Robbie Graff that again fascinates me is, you know, in, in audio equipment, I, I still believe that most companies have a house sound, and particularly with cartridges and speakers, you know, transducers. But he grasps that bands have a house sound. You know, the Rolling Stones sound the way they want to sound. Uh, I'm not sure all artists do that, but to be that young and to be that clear about what you actually want. I mean, and that album, to me, I remember when I first heard it, it sounded, you know, it sounded amateurish, like, like Bob Ludwig was suggesting, but that was its charm. It sounded, it had an intimacy connected to its kind of DIY aesthetic. And it didn't sound overproduced. And in my lifetime, I have been turned off by more records for overproduction than underproduction. Yeah, yeah, I've, I feel that a lot, that records, the production gets in the way of, for me, what I, what I want in my head, what I want the music to sound like sometimes, horns and strings, and just it's just like too cluttered, too much stuff in there that doesn't really fit. And me being the audiophile, uh, I see it as, oh, that stuff was added later on after the band, you know, cut the tracks. They said, oh, this needs strings or horns or something. It's like, it's, you know, it's The it's message a mess. of the music is in the sound of the sound. It's in the sound character. You know, I mean, one of the things that was so radical about punk was it just came at you, you know. It was like, you know, it could be 80% distorted, you know. That was part of the... You know, you didn't need it. It wasn't like, you know, we're doing a string quartet and we need everybody to be clear and right, spatial right, right. and all that. And, you know, taste evolves. You know, it's like if I listen to an old record, it, it sounds like I can date it, even if I've never heard it, by the sound. Oh, yeah, especially the drum sound. And that, <laughs> yeah, especially the drum sound, right. you're right. 
But even just some of the equipment, we were listening to a thing before, and you could just hear they had a couple of pieces of vintage, like Poltec or right, right. Fairchild or yeah. whatever, in the system, and they were using it on one or more of the tracks, and it just jumped out, and it was period. Because after 1980 or 99, by 1990, that was gone. Yeah, I mean, all that was history, yeah. You know, but you still have to come up with your sound. Sound styles really do change over time you know those remember the drum sounds in the 80s and 90s that kind of like pop doesn't even wind up sounding like drums anymore it's just this like percussive hit more than an actual drum you know or cymbals or something cymbals you know brass cymbals were replaced with uh, a sound effect like tss, 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 that that was the cymbal you know? it's just so infuriating at the time and the other thing that bugged me about recordings in the 90s and early 2000s was this overuse of synthesizers as beds you know like this stuff that's at the bottom of the mix it's just sort of goes through the song just this it's just like why is that there <laughs> what is it doing it's it's just there to say oh look we we're using uh, this synthesizer bass you know this uh, bed to the music as if that was a good thing. Obviously, some people did think it was a good thing. That's why they kept doing it. But you'll notice that they almost never do that anymore. That's all history. Someone asked, by the way... If we were at Woodstock. Right. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't at Woodstock. Uh, someone asked about this CD rack. And the thing is, the company that made this is long out of business. I have like five or six of these things. And they went out of business at least... 20 years ago, so they, you can't get them anymore, but they are really good, really, really good. Um, so were you at Woodstock? No. See, here's the thing. I was going to go to Woodstock. I bought tickets to go to Woodstock. Really? Yeah, I had tickets. I, you know, I bought them in the mail, and I had tickets, but my ride, my friend Mike, he had not Mike Trey, this other Mike, uh, he had a new car. And when he saw, because we weren't going to, you know, it was three days of, you know, peace and music. So we weren't going to go on the first day. We were going to go on Saturday. And he's watching TV and seeing all the mud and everything. And he's like, I don't want my shiny new car, you know, going through the mud. So, so he chickened out. But the thing is, in retrospect, I am glad I didn't go to Woodstock. I would have been so miserable sleeping in the mud and the, no, I'm looking for bathrooms and stuff. Even the uh, 18, 19 year old version of me would not be happy. Uh, camping uh, out there and remember this sound was a very crude sound system and there were 500,000 people there so the speakers were really far away <laughs> you know people that I know that went there they barely could hear anything so but it's the vibe of the whole dome yeah, that, that it's a dome nice. over this scene yeah and you're in it if I could have helicoptered in like the rock stars did and just Go in there, walk around for a couple hours, and then get out. Yeah, I would do that. You wouldn't want to wait that in wasn't... line for two days to get in? To take a leak? No, I didn't want to do that. Uh -huh. so, uh, so, yeah, that was that. But, uh, you know, the one thing I did do is I went to see Paul Simon in Central Park in the 80s. And there were 500,000 people there. I mean, it was gigantic. 500,000? Yeah. And I was seated or standing uh, like halfway back because I got there early in the afternoon to, to get a reasonably good spot. And then Mrs. Audiophiliac, she was working, so she was going to join me, you know, when she got out of work. So it's like, okay, how, do you, how are you going to find me <laughs> in 500,000 people? And the, the, the thing that we did was... Robin had always made quilts. There used to be a quilt over here. It's not there right now. But she had always made these quilts. So I brought one of her quilts and a big stick. And around the time she was expected to show up, I put the, the, the quilt over the stick and I hoisted it up like this and I was holding it like that. And people all, all around me were saying, what are you doing? I said, I, I want my wife to be able to find me in this, in this sea of people. And like, really? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing here. So eventually Robin did come. And when she came, like people all around were like applauding, like, oh really, this is this is your wife. And I said, Yeah, so it all it all worked out. And that really was a great concert. So uh I I did have a good time with that. But anyway, um we should we if you have questions. There's a lot of questions. Okay, so answer some. Uh they go they come and go really fast. I'm I gonna know. move closer to the screen so I can see this. Okay. I can't see that. There did any of us ever see Zappa? I've seen Zappa a couple of no, times. No, I did not. Uh I actually walked out of a Zappa concert, don't laugh. Uh where did you see him? 
in Chicago, and he was opening for the Cream. Oh, wow. Believe it or not. And uh, I thought this, I called it fake jazz before, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Laurie. Before John Laurie called it fake jazz. But okay. I told my friend, yeah, this is fake jazz. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're old. We're definitely <laughs> old. Yeah, we've seen a lot. And the good news is, and I, I, I just have to say this, more than answering questions about like line magnetic or, you know, even gear right away, to explain being old. <laughs> yes. I was born I'm, in I'm 49. Curious. Yes, me too. Which, yeah, we're only like six weeks apart. Right. And that gave me the opportunity to be in a lot of places. You know, I've rode in real hot rods, you know, real chop and channel right. hot rods. I've driven them with no windshield and big motors sticking up in the air. And, you know, heard early rock and roll on a radio, but it went all the way through. You know, I came to New York, you know, I was in Chicago. You, you came to New York in the early 70s or late, late 70s? No, this is in the early 60s oh. and, or mid 60s. I got my driver's license in 66, but this was the time when, you know, blues people came to Chicago and they started getting electric and they got electric. People don't really realize this, I don't think. But even, you know, even Muddy Waters, who came there with some reputation in advance, they were out on the street and people were selling, you know, schmatas and all this stuff on the street. And it was noisy and you had to like cut through the crowd to get people to put money in your cup. Mm -hmm. And they literally were using amplifiers, and a lot of it was uh, gospel, revival kind. Of, everyone was competing for attention to get their cup filled. And a lot of really great blues musicians. Wow. Robert Nighthawk would be a great example, but there's tons of them. Uh, and then they moved up. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be the right age for that. And then they're, you know, so you're in clubs. Yeah. Oh, I got lucky. I worked in a chess record store, so in, don't laugh, to get into a blues club like Silvio's or whatever in Chicago, you had to be 21. Uh-oh. And in some cases, 23. Ooh, really? Just because they didn't, you know, they, they didn't want, want any riff. kids, yeah. Right. But because of who my friend's father was as this chess record dealer, I got to go, I saw Holland Wolf when I was 14 years old. Wow. Sitting in the front table. Wow. He was huge, right? He, he was died. huge. And he actually hit one of the guys in his band enough to splatter blood on the wall. Yeah. And I'm like a teenage kid. I'm from the suburbs. I'm like, I never saw anything like this. And they kept starting the same song over and over. I'm going, why don't they just play it? <laughs> you know, they started the same song like five times without getting past. What, like, they, what were they doing? Why didn't it continue? Holland Wolf wasn't really happy oh, okay. with what was going on. He was a gr large, grumpy fellow. Yes, I could see and, uh, But again, so I came to New York in the 70s, I, you know, 74, and I'm living just blocks from CBGBs, you know, so there it is. And it's like being a geezer has its advantage. We, I mean, this was a good period to be in the right place at the right time, Absolutely. including right now, right here yeah, with us today. This is, this is a good time, right? This here. is a good, I mean, we lived to make it to YouTube live. Yeah, this is my destiny. I'm, <laughs> say, I'm saying it to be funny, but it's actually really true. And you it's know? who you are it's now. It's who I am more than anything else I've ever done. And I've done, done a lot of things in my life. That's true. And even as a writer, the 20 years preceding all of this, when I was strictly a writer, an audio reviewer writer, uh, you know, I had that imposter syndrome thing like, hmm, I don't know that I'm that good. I just kept getting work, so I must have been some kind of good. But once I started shooting videos, unlike this one, I mean, it just, I'm, I apologize for the false starts. Videos feel like a natural medium for me. I'm very comfortable doing this. I'm very comfortable talking to a camera because some people find that kind of weird. It's like, I don't know. It's... But anyway, I- You're I, comfortable talking. I'm a good talker. Herb had this great line years ago. <laughs> I'll never Not forget. far from here, just blocks from Not, here, yeah. walking down the sidewalk. Walking down the street, he said, this is when I was a writer. And he says, Steve, you know, you talk better than you write. And you were very offended. And I said, you know, Herb, that's, that's not a compliment because I am a writer. <laughs> so I, before the YouTube thing. So it, Herb predicted the future. And Herb actually was instrumental in me becoming a writer. 
Do you remember that? Because you said this line, which d this part didn't really pan out. But you said, you know, the thing about writing is it's a very portable profession. Right. You could be anywhere. You could sit with, on the with, beach. You know, in those days with a typewriter or a computer. And you could do it anywhere. And for some reason, not that I'm the traveling kind of guy. But that appealed to me. It's like you don't have to be at an office. You, you don't have to be anywhere to do it, you know. That, Look at a that, friend who wrote a novel on a Blackberry. Yeah, so that was really cool. But anyway, YouTube... Making videos is my medium. I found it, uh, as they say, late in life. But main thing is, I'm here, and I'm really enjoying this. Six years into this thing, and we just hit 240,000 subscribers. Thank you very much, everybody. And, uh, yeah, it's been a great ride. I mean, I, I look at the older videos, and I'm like, oh, they're so crude, you know? But, hey, I was learning on the job. So it all worked out. What do you, what do you see there, Herb? I see something I have to comment okay, on. Okay, good. And they're going by fast. If yeah. you don't get your question answered, don't take it personally. Yeah. This stuff is really small print and it's going by. But one of the person's names was Snake Oil something or other. Oh. And you know what? <laughs> I have to respond to the Snake Oil concept. Please do. People say this. You know, I'm forever... Steve was afraid to get stuck in the mud and no place to pee at Woodstock. That's a fear. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what people who are afraid of snake oil, like... Well, it's a uh, ripoff. But are they afraid they're going to be taken? No, because they're too smart. Right. They're, 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 they're uh, uh, projecting onto right. other people. I'm, yeah. Those that's stupid what I, people. That, right. <laughs> that's what I mean. I mean, I've never... I, I've taken pride in my gullibility. <laughs> I really have my whole life. And you know, if you, I'm speaking to somebody, I meet you on the street, I assume, and part of me doesn't even care right. you're te if you're telling the truth. Follow that. I assume you're telling the truth. And if you're not, who cares? Right. You're telling the story. Right. That's you talking. And that to me is the reality. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to analyze it. But more back to audio because you know, I don't, I, you know, if there's snake oil, it's got to be in an ad or something like that, right? You know, you know oh, we're selling cable and it or uses... Or a review. Them. Right, or a review. I mean, I'm not even sure reviewers buy into, buy into it. I don't, I've, I've known a lot of reviewers. I might know most of them. And you know what? First of all, I don't know any of them that are, you know... This is no, there's no payola, there's right. no, there's no crookedness. I mean, I think, I know for myself, I like to review products by people I like. Right. And I like to review products, like, if I, if I talk about a product a bunch, it's like I identify with it. It doesn't mean it's better or worse than another product, mm -hmm. but it's a product that I personally... Oh, Herb likes, uh, I'm, before I came here today, it was crazy. I listened, I bought an old Lenko turntable, L75. I think it's from maybe 1970 or something. It, it had a sure M3D cartridge on it. And I wasn't digging the sound so much. So I put an Audio-Technica cartridge on it. And it was like, before I came here, I played organ music on this through the Heretics. I was like... I was so, like, excited. Mm. I mean, before I came here, if I seem revved up now, it's because <laughs> I'm old. I've been listening critically to this stuff since the days of Dynaco in the 60s, and I'm more excited by it than ever. And part of it is I'm not afraid of making a mistake. I'm not afraid of the snake oil. The snake oil comes to me, uh, I'll learn. I will have the experience and money doesn't, you know, you know, I wouldn't spend ten thousand dollars on something I wasn't sure I really liked or wanted, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm not going to buy, spend ten grand on snake oil, but I'm not even sure. There's, there's, I think there's the worst problem with hi-fi today. My fear in buying product mm -hmm. is that it'll be boring. Yeah, boring not that it'll be snake oil that they lied to me, right. but it'll just be. Oh, it's another little two-way speaker with a five-inch woofer, and it sounds like another little speaker. Right. That's my fear, to be caught in dull, boring right. sound. As in, who cares? Right. Yeah. If yeah, it's yeah. weird sound, I can live with that for a while. You know, we were talking about this an hour before we started this thing about 
you know, small two-way stand mount speakers. There's many wonderful ones. I've reviewed them, I've owned them. I get it, right? But the thing is, there is a certain sameness to them because they all have more or less one inch tweeters and four or five or six inch woofers in a very small box. What can they do? A different uh, uh, cone material, different box material, yeah, th those are the things. But as soon as you get out of that thing and you get to a larger speaker, let's say a small floor standing speaker, the possibilities seem to open up a lot more. The difference between one and the next one is, is, is bigger. And then if you went to like a MagnaPan, it's considerably more so, more different, more expansive. You just hear more music and stuff than you can out of a little box. Now I do say, and I really do believe this, the best way to listen to a two-way stand mount speaker is to be in the near field at the midfield or midfield. So three or four feet away or up to like four, five or six feet away, that's when they are best. If you're listening to a little box speaker from 10 feet away, they sound like, to me at least, they sound like tiny little speakers trying to fill a room, and, and that doesn't cut it. But, you know, oh, I just want to change the subject about Herb. You know, <laughs> Herb and I have these conversations like all this day. all day. Many days a week, we, we talk for an hour or two, so we can never run out of things to say. But one of the things that Herb says that I just love, because first of all, I do it as well, but he brings up this idea that he listens to music while he's sleeping. And, you know, when Robin, my wife, is away, she's on vacation or something, doing stuff with her friends, I have music on while I'm sleeping as well. And it's really funny. What I do is I wake up in the middle of the night and I go, ooh, that's really good. Me too. This happens a lot, right? And then I, like, figure out what the song is, right? And I go, oh, man, I'm going to listen to that tomorrow, right? And I, this, I mean, sometimes really great music has come to me in the middle of the night, and I just happen to wake up for, you know, two minutes to figure out what it is. And I love that. But I do think sleeping with music on uh, is, a, is a really interesting thing. Now, Herb has an advantage over me because you're listening to music over your, your system. Right. Now, my, my couch and my bed fold and open right. and close. So you have much higher fidelity it, experience. Right, and I'm actually in a good spot, but I wake up in the morning and I just unmute it. Uh -huh. And I'm like, wow. And then you, it, I'd say literally, out of seven days in a week, mm -hmm. six of those days I wake up and go, oh my God, I gotta right. save this. This is really good. And it's just rune radio, finding right. something. Very often before I go to sleep though, I pick a song that I wanted to riff on, you know, mm -hmm. Pandora-like. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Somebody asked a question there, and one of it was about parts. And Steve and I might be different on this, and I might be different than many people. You mean the I, quality of the parts? The quality of the parts in an audio circuit. And I can only speak with any real authority on tube amplification, and particularly amplification without feedback. If there's much feedback, that ameliorates the sound. If I change the capacitors in an amp, and there's feedback, you're not going to hear it very much. If there's 20 dBs of feedback, you can change resistors and capacitors and even tubes, and it's not going to change the sound that much. But when the, when the amp is raw, like if it's just a plain old, you know, a 6 DJ8 or a 300B or something, and there's not any real, you know, 6 dB is not much feedback, but if there isn't much, the sound of the parts might be the biggest part of what you're experiencing. Black gate, someone's saying black gate, black gate capacitor. I imported. I was the first person in America, I believe, bragging Herb, I believe I discovered black gate and I imported them for a bunch of years until I hooked up with Audio Note in the 90s. But, uh, and transformers. I mean, you know, two amps, at the end of the day, they're as good as the transformers that are connected to the output. And there's no way around it, unfortunately. But to answer your question, yes. And even on very, you know, very inexpensive products, I think quality of parts affect the character. And by the character, I mean, how does it feel to sit there? Not bad or good, is it? Mm. I also, I want to make this really clear. If I only make one point today, what parts do is they're not like adding seasoning to something you're baking or cooking really? okay. at all. What capacitors and resistors, like we'll pretend audio note silver capacitors or really good resistors or black gate capacitors, they're letting more low level information through. It's, they're not 
season they're, they're not tone controls. They're not tone controls at all. They're literally letting more small scale information. And the opposite, if you can't hear, if you change the capacitor in your amp that has 20 dBs or 30 dBs of feedback, and you can't hear that difference, it doesn't mean it's snake oil. It means that you can't hear all kinds of other differences <laughs> either. Because if you can't hear that cap change, think about what else you can't hear. Uh, okay. And again, it always, for me, goes back to tone. Hmm. When the tone is right, and we all know this, you know what your mother's voice sounds like. You know, you know what the siren on the street sounds like. There are so many sounds we know well. Our brain is really good at like doing all the Rolodex to get that nailed down. You know what? Here's the thing, you know, people used to say, this is a, a mantra for some people, if there's no such thing as oral memory, A-U-R-A-L. No such thing as oral People memory. said that? They said that. And I said, you know what? Here's an example of why that's not true. If you have a friend that you haven't been in touch with for 20 years, right? And they call you and they just say, hello. They don't say, hi, it's Jack. They just say, hello. You always know. I always know. No. You know, I can always tell. This, this used to happen on a more regular basis. But anyway, yeah, even if I don't have spoken to someone in a long time, they don't have to identify themselves. They don't have to talk for five minutes before I figure out who it is. I can almost, well, yeah, I can almost always tell. Who in a few is. seconds. Yeah, so that's like, and that's oral memory. There's no other clue. There's no visual. It's a telephone. Uh, yeah, so. I think it might be response. our best memory, actually. I think we're better at oral memory. I'm sure we are. I mean, at least I can only speak for myself because I only inhabit this consciousness. But my memory, oral memory, is way, way better than my visual memory. And I have a good visual memory. I mean, I'm a painter. That's what I do. And I interpret sound when I'm sitting in front of, sitting, you know, listening to two speakers. Part of the reason I like what's going on in between the sound stage or the sound space or the performers is it's kind of like I spend most of my time looking at paintings and the paintings are between it. That's why I like dark because then I'm not distracted by a painting, but I still, uh, my vision dominates at some level mm -hmm. while I'm listening, but my memory is not of the vision. Mm -hmm. So I listen to your record, I go, oh, and David Chesky makes a record, me and Steve listen to it. When I'm listening to it, I'm, I'm seeing the three-dimensional space. Mm. When I'm remembering it, I'm remembering the sound of the instruments. Mm. Sounds dumb, but it, that's the way it yeah. is. You know, I, I, I want to touch on one thing really briefly, is that there have been times where I've heard a very well sorted out, meaning well chosen system, reasonably well set up in a room that has decent acoustics. And I listen to it and I think, eh, it's just, it's okay. I mean, there's some something that's missing, some tweak, some setup, something that's not quite there. And it basically, it just falls apart. And then the next day, I'm at a friend's house who's not an audiophile and they have a, like a little, you know, $500 system. And I'm listening, thinking, oh, I'm, I'm having a good time listening to this very, very humble, nothing fancy system, and it's playing the Rolling Stones or something. It's like, this is good. This is really good. It's like that old thing of like driving in your car with an AM radio and being like totally into the music and stuff over the a relatively low fidelity device. So whether it's really the best stuff or really very, very humble, you can still be moved by it. And that's kind of my my thing, you know, is how much I'm feeling the music when I when I do it and that when I'm listening and that's it, it's, oh so somebody else asked by the way do we have a, a speaker that we just like have a lifelong love affair with the sound signature of that speaker and uh, for me uh, since I've heard a lot of things I gotta say my years my three years of living with the Klipsch Cornwall that's way up there in terms of Klipsch's sound signature, the way it makes music feel live as it, as it's and meaning it, it's happening right now in front of me. Now, the, the, my reference speakers now are Pure Audio Project Duet 15s. They don't do that thing. They do a different thing. And for now, at least, I would say the Pure Audio Projects are definitely my favorite over the Cornwalls. But in terms of like a very long-term thing, uh, and other clips that I've lived with, the, the clips sound really goes
goes deep with me. It really, it truly does. Do you have one? A speaker that you feel you know, that it's over funny. the long term? And it, 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 it ties even on what you were talking about before between AM radio. I mean, I know from my own memories that my my biggest, my strongest emotional response to music, unquestionably, not even close in second, is the radio in the car. In the old days, new radios seem a little, uh, let's just say there's too much software between no. me and the music. I don't feel very directly connected, but those old radios had a way of kind of punching through the dash yeah. at you yeah. and getting you. And I still, that's what I'm looking for if, for a retirement system or, you know, before I came here, I mean, and I'm sorry if I'm stuck on this, but it was a big deal. And I'm grateful when you can get old and still get cranked up. I was listening to a Lenko 75 that I bought used for $750 with a $50 cartridge, an Audio Technica. So it's an $800. But right next to it, I've got literally a $20,000 Fiker with really, I can't mention the tone arm because I'm reviewing it uh, or the cartridge, but it's a $20,000 arm and cartridge. And in some ways it's the best, you know, since in the 21st century, it's the best turntable I've had. But when I go home now, I want to hear, I want to hear the Lenko <laughs> again. And part of it is I played a French Harmonia Monday organ record and there was nothing. People talk about transparency. A $50 cartridge. I'm sitting there. A sure cartridge. A sh no, the, this was an, eight, oh, an okay. audio technica. It was the oh, BM95E, the elliptical one. There was, it felt like there was nothing between me and this organ. It was really, I kept playing it over going, oh my God, and I've got a friend coming over from Stereophile tomorrow. First thing I'm going to do is put this down. I'm not going to play the 20,000. I'm going to put this thing on and go, well, <laughs> and just see what their response is. Mm -hmm. And the, this is an important point, I think, for people who are wrestling with, you know, putting something together, which I still think is the real fun part. You know, my, I always believe don't go for anything that looks like some kind of ideal or perfection. Go for what's curious to you, hmm. Hmm. what you're interested in, just to hear it. You know, it's not like, you don't have to marry it. You just <laughs> have to listen to it. Hmm. And I bought this Lenko partly because I just wanted to hear it. And now it's, you know, it's unbelievable. Okay, you want to change the speed on it? You need a, a, you need a, a socket wrench to change the speed on it. And you move this iron bar. <laughs> I mean... There's no software, there's no, there's no display. Everything is completely mechanical. I mean, even when you're, the off and on switch is just moving an idler wheel. Uh -huh. And I'm not, you know, that's where if, okay, I'm old, but may, you know, maybe if the creek don't rise, I could live another 50 years or something. And during that time, I'd like things to be able to try. Uh -huh. I mean, if I, I've owned, I mean it. I've owned million. I've had million dollar systems for a year at a time, so it's not like I don't know what those things sound like, and they sound good. You know, I mean, one of the beauties of them is you wanted it so people walk in the room and they go, "Oh, that sounds good." Right. And if they didn't, it wasn't worth a million bucks. Right. That's for sure. I went. I just want to change the subject to a gripe. One of my one of my big problems with being a reviewer. And, and this is rarely brought up by other reviewers, but it's something I deal with and have been dealing with for years. It's just a little worse right now. And that is, I'm in contact with a publicist or a company about reviewing a product. And, okay, I want to do the, they're pitching me, like, Steve, do you want to review this? I say, yes, I want to review it. And then the next question is, when am I going to get it? And they, when they say you're going to have it in a few days, 50% of the time, that's not even close, right? Sometimes it isn't a few days. A lot of times it's like two months later. So this thing that I ask them, and then I like I needed to do one other thing, you know? It's like, so when is this product X going to show up, you know? And, and they just don't know. And sometimes it's even the manufacturer of the thing itself 
that's actually made in the country, whether, <laughs> and they still can't answer this question because there's, there's a legitimate reason. They're waiting for a part, they're waiting for this, something, they're having a problem with something. Those things are, I, I understand, but it's just so frustrating because now I have a whole bunch of things that are supposed to happen that aren't happening and I'm pub bugging the publicist saying, when? And they don't know. <laughs> I'm having the you, same and problem. And my point is they were chasing me saying, Steve, you wanna do it, you wanna do it? And I said, yeah, I wanna do it. Uh, two months later, where is it? You know, I'm still waiting. So and that, then it shows up and it doesn't work. And then it shows up, and that's another story, yeah. So, yeah, I want some there, there isn't snake oil, but there might be a lemon here and there. Wow. I mean, I'm a car guy, and there were a few lemons. Yeah. You know, there were cars, no, you don't want to yeah, buy that car. Yeah, yeah. But they were still worth owning. I mean, who wouldn't want, you know, I, the cars they named lemons, actually, were kind of interested, you know. Yeah, oh, I like that. What was that Chevy? The Chevette. Yeah. We rented one day, uh, my wife and I... You mean the Vega? No, it was called the Chevette. I don't even know this that This was one. after the Vega. The Vega I owned, and it was a lemon. I thought they looked kind of cool, but this Chevette was just... I think it was made in Poland or something. No offense, but um, it was a terrible car. I mean, it just... just It felt awful. It was being a feeling thing. So we turned around and, and brought it back. But in uh, any case... Um, yeah, I think overall, uh, getting products in for review that are truly awful is extremely rare. I mean, I couldn't give you an accurate number how many products I've had come through this room, but it's probably close to 2,000 things. And, you know, it's very, very few. And I've talked about the one that was the all-time worst stinker. Uh, and you know what? I forgot the name of the company because it's not an audio company. It was a computer company. But anyway... Um, you know, the everyday stuff has been for quite some time good. You know, good like serviceable. You could listen to it, enjoy it, and be, you know, be good, right? So, well, cars are kind of like hi-fi. I mean, I keep asking myself, and some of the questions bouncing around are similar to this. I need intensity. Mm. Well, I want to turn it. the damn thing on, and I want to, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's nice. You know. It's not that easy to come by. Right. Well, that's... It's, it's, it's fairly scarce, actually. Right. And well, that's because it's rising above. But I'm saying that But it's the, not a money thing, necessarily. Thing. Yeah, well, that's why I said, you know, about I've been impressed with $500 systems. It's happened, you know, so it's, it's good. So uh, since Herb's uh, handling the question thing, let's see. If... They're going by. I apologize like crazy. Let's They're going by. Some... And I know many of you people, and I'm grateful you're here. And I'm honored by your, these attentions, but man, it's flying by. Uh, some of them are very funny, and I would never repeat them, <laughs> especially when they're about Steve. Oh, no. <laughs> you have to say nice things about me. Oh, that nobody says anything bad. Uh, I do want to. I do want to point out, though. I mean, I think transducers, like a speaker. It's got to fit in your room and be your personality. <laughs> right. Those are two really big deals. Yeah. Like, you know, I come to Steve's, and before we do things like this, we're sitting around listening to one or more of the speakers. Today I wanted to hear the... Um, yeah, I mean, technology. The, and I really needed to hear them. And you know what? This is something not everybody, particularly probably people out there, ever get to do. I get to hear a lot of systems. You know, and people invite us. And Mike Trey, we get invited to hear things. And, you know, the old subjective, objective thing. If you get to hear a lot, one, you're entertained. But B, you get to recognize the tarot card that jumps out of the deck. You know, the more you hear, the more you recognize difference. Remember that time three or four years ago when we went to uh, Bob Vicentainer and we we heard the Alta Vista something? The, the giant the Alta one. open baffles. And he was playing this Miles Davis record. Pretty sure it was Blues in Orbit. A, a record I've heard a million times. Yeah, it was Blues in Orbit. And it was so, you know, hearing into it, it was recorded at, you know, this big church that was converted into a studio called Columbia 30th Street. And to hear that room so, because it was recorded there, it's always been in the recording. Hearing it like we heard it that one time was one of those 
Yeah. I got up and walked. The soundstage, don't laugh, soundstage, was so big. And it was mostly behind the speakers, but the speakers were maybe 20 feet from the wall. Yeah. And it was a fancy, I think, I can't remember, but it was one of those uh, tech-ass turntables. It might have been like, yeah, right, yeah. you know, it was a serious, serious. Yeah. $100,000. At least 100000 playing the record. I got up to see if I could walk in between the musicians. <laughs> and you know what? I could. Wow. I could go over there and stand by the musicians. Uh -huh. I've never really experienced Because one of the things people don't realize about horns, and you see it a little bit with the clips like your cornwells, but when you get into big horns, like the big Altex and Western stuff, the soundstage is in front of the speakers. Mm. People aren't used to that. I've seen systems where a mono system, I remember it really, it was the salt cellar system. Mississippi Fred McDowell was literally sitting on the woofer playing his guitar full size. Mm. And it's out in front. The woofer is the closest thing to you, the, and then it was big, but it was just the right height. The top of the woofer was about stool height, and you could hear him. Wow. And that's my point. Whatever you buy stuff, it should be more interesting than the last stuff. Right. Not better. More exciting, different. more interesting. Different. I'm into the difference. Different. Absolutely. Different is good all by itself, but if it's more intense, right. the never worst had... case scenario is it'll be annoying. Right. That's you, the worst. You never had tubes? Try. Try. Where possible, get some tubes in your system. You ever had a horn speaker or a panel speaker or an omnidirectional speaker? By the way, I, I, here's a, a plug. So my friend, John Strobin at Ohm Acoustics, uh, things are changing there, and I hear that the company is for sale, and I told him I would do anything I could to help. Uh, he didn't really have any requests for me or anything, but he's such a sweet human being. He's working hard. He's coming up with new ideas. The man is in his late 70s or 80s, and uh, I got to say, a total gentleman, gentleman. The people that buy those speakers love them and love him. So anyway, uh, a shout out to Alm Acoustics and, and uh, John Strobin for being, uh, as we say, uh, a mensch. He is a mensch. And uh, what else? Um, we're going to be winding down pretty soon. I, again, I have to just keep apologizing over and over again because a hundred questions went by. <laughs> And I maybe didn't even grab any yeah. of the, even anywhere not, near the we're good not ones. Smart enough to stop it, it from moving. It's really hard to answer a specific product question, like about line magnetic. I saw a few. Uh, you know, I didn't mention. You know, it, I tried not even to mention too many brand names myself. So it's really hard to do a specific recommendation. Mm. I can hear the sound of my mother's voice and know it perfectly. But I can't hear what you're hearing. Right. I can't hear your mother's voice. And or, that's a or big Or predict difference. what you like. Or predict what you like. I mean, I know people, including people at Stereophile that are, you know, I work with on a daily basis. They listen way more left brain than I do. John mm -hmm. Atkinson would be a great example, and we're really good buddies. And, you know, together we make a whole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I can't predict, you know, there's so much in the balance, but I do want to, the word that sticks out and that even on all our conversations before, it's important to know the word aesthetic, and to have some notion when you get dressed in the morning. I wear black most of the time. I have a, a uniform, but it's very carefully engineered, curated, so to speak. And I was standing in, actually in Italy Someone said, Herb, why do you always wear black? And I didn't know, I took it as an affront, and I didn't know what to say. And this was many years ago. And this other guy who was there from Hungary, he goes, that's, that's to show that he's from below 14th Street in New York. <laughs> that's the uniform they wear. You know what? He's right. And, you know, where you come from, California sound, New England sound, you know, sound is really, it's, it's regional, it's ethnic. Mm. Uh, what language you speak may affect what makes the this, this sound sound good. And you know where you can do that? If you buy like a Japanese pressing, an LP, of, a, of something you're familiar with, you have the English pressing or an American pressing, and then you buy the Japanese one, 
that's to the Japanese taste. They or may not fit for you, but that's one way to, you know, explore that. No, if I you're did. A, if you're a vinyl person. I think the same with audio. I mean, I bought records. I tended to buy records on the brand a lot. Oh, I yeah, mean, by the label. Yeah. By the label, yeah. And I it, don't laugh. I sort my records. I'd only have about three or four hundred now, but I used to have thousands and thousands. And I just I divide them into black and white and by label. And that's it. And I still, all my records are organized by label. Mm -hmm. And I kind of know the artists on that label. Uh, and I go there, you know, uh, yeah. for that sound. Yeah, but we, yeah, we talked about like, you know, the sound of ECM records, you know, the sound of Atlantic records or Columbia records. It's interesting, like in the whole jazz collector thing, which I am not, a, I have a lot of records, but I'm not a collector. But it's like people have this thing about Coltrane and stuff. I'm thinking, yeah, but what about Monk when he was on Columbia, you know, or Mingus on Columbia? It's like, that's great music. And it's not one of those things that you hear about constantly with, uh, it's funny. It's really funny. But I think Atlantic's uh, jazz stuff is, is my taste. I'm not, you know, chasing Blue Note records. I would never spend a lot of money for any record. And I never have. I don't think I've ever spent more than 50 or $60 at the top. So I'm not buying any Blue Notes. But I do like Atlantic, the, the record company Atlantic, with Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin, and of course, Cream and Crosby, Stills and Nash, all that stuff. That label, you know, they had this phenomenal engineer, Tom Dowd, who was just wrote about it. Just incredible. And by the way, he was also part of the, you know, the whole Oppenheimer thing. He, Tom Dowd, when he was a kid, was in was working on the Manhattan Project for the bomb. So wow. he's the guy's uh, on a polymath or something. Whatever. Really interesting man. You should, if you're interested at all, you should search out the documentary that was done maybe ten years ago on Tom Dowd. Really interesting I guy. To. I want to point out something though, yeah. and this is I'm sure everyone here can identify with this. I've done this, for better or worse. I've tuned my system. I've made decisions on speakers and cartridges, particularly cartridges and turntables, that suit the labels that I collect. Ah, ah. Like, I'm pretty sure, I might be wrong, that many people are building systems today based on the sound of Blue Note recordings. And they want those recorded. And I, I, you have my permission and, <laughs> I, and my blessing. I think it's really important to do that. I have a few labels that I just, if, if, like, you know, my whole section of French Harmonia Monday, if it doesn't sound spectacular, there's something wrong with what I'm using. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally condone and, and even recommend making your system play your records the way you like. It's all about it's you. It's not more complicated than <laughs> It that. really is. You're really into the Grateful Dead? Damn it, those Grateful Dead records should sound good. If they don't, it doesn't matter what the specifications right. are or the measurements were. Right, that's a good, really good point. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to reggae is your big thing, yeah, go for And reggae. not every system plays reggae. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's interesting. I have this weird going in both ways about reggae. To me, a lot of reggae records don't sound well recorded, mixed or mastered. But then I realized that sometimes it's the system that I'm playing it on that they actually are better than I thought, but they sound, they're too distorted, they're too this, they're too that. But actually when you hear it, when everything lines up, it definitely makes sense, you know. And hearing the bottom end in a reggae recording, which is obviously really important, it's interesting how different speakers that do bass some of them don't do the reggae bass all that they well. They don't do they're, reggae bass. They're too, they're too, they don't have any tunefulness in them. They're just kind of lumping along and limping along. And then some of them, it's like, yeah, it's right there. And that, when you get it, when you get it like working, it's so exciting. I mean, just, you need big paper cones, really. You need big paper. You if get, you want to play reggae, you do. You need big yeah, paper cones. Yeah. You know, they're into the whole sound system thing. It's but so I also, I've learned, I have this record. Okay. And I, it, it's called Marcus Garvey. It's by Burning Spear, which is, what's his name, Rodney, or uh, Rodney's his last name. Anyhow, this record, the reason that all these, you know,
reggae records don't sound good. It's the grooves are this wide. <laughs> and you can look inside the grooves. And you, do you know how fast that cartridge is accelerating? It's just slamming into the guardrail over here and then slamming into the... It's a roller coaster, yeah. Right. I mean, you, most people's record player are not enjoy Wide grooves. And I told this to Mike Trey, but I'm going to throw it out there to the multitude. I, put, I have this record. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a measurements guy, but... It's called Sure Era 4. Oh, it's a test record. It's a test record. And it, at the beginning, it has, you got to be a geezer. You got to be born a long time ago. Sure, it's, it's S-H-U-R-E. Right, S-H-U-R-E, the microphone slash cartridge people who don't make cartridges anymore. But it's called Era 4. And on side one, they play orchestral bells, uh, a flute, and a harp. Yeah, these are tracking tests. And these are tracking tests, and there's five levels. And they brought this record out because they knew their Sure V15 Type 4 was going to track it like no problem at all. Right, right. You know what? If you buy this record, I mean, I recommend it, and you play those five tracks, besides the fact that the, it's really well recorded, you can see these grooves that are this wide. By the time you get to... As you go from level one to level five, the grooves get wider and wider. And you know what? You play that record and it, you listen to it, that's how your system sounds. It Ooh. really does. You want to know what your system sounds like? Play those, you know, those introductory tracks. It sounds so corny, but it really works. Yeah, there were lots of test records back in the old days. This is old school test Yeah, record. these are from the 60s, or maybe even 50s. Yeah, I think the f level four might have been oh, 70s. Oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, pre-digital. You know, that's that's one way to look at this stuff, is like audio before digital and audio, you know, right. in the digital age that we're in now. These are $6 on eBay usually, or <laughs> under 10 And, you know, it's funny that uh, as much as, you know, we've lived through this and a lot of you have going from analog to digital, and, you know, when I did that thing recently about downsizing your system, and I mentioned, I hear it all the time from people that said, oh, I had to get rid of all my records, I was moving, I was getting a divorce, all these things. And how many times people regret that and then have to try to, you know, rebuild that, some portion of that record collection all over again. It is amazingly common. Now, I'm not saying that some people that moved on from analog to digital aren't happy and they're they're happy with digital and they have no regrets about getting rid of analog. I know that there's a lot of you guys out there that feel that way and that's cool. I'm just saying it's interesting that the people who, uh, let's say, aborted uh, analog and then lived with digital and then came back, that's really interesting. In other words, they tried both sides of the street and they realized, you know what, I just enjoy listening to music more on vinyl. And that to me is, because at least those people have tried, have, you know, Sample both, pardon the pun. I did that. I mean, there was a period when I moved, when I was living on the boat, there was no room. I had all, I, at that point, don't laugh. A houseboat. A houseboat. I had 10,000 records, but I had them on skids with blue tarps over them. And I'm going, this is not going to happen. I mean, they were getting moldy. Mm. And so I just sold them all to a guy with a truck for nothing, for like 25 cents a piece. But I kept 100, and I still have a few of those, and I... But what I've noticed, I mean, when digital came along, a lot of people have been bugging me about the early days of digital. And I was kind of slow. My first CD player was, don't laugh, a, a Sony Discman. And I had that until like 92. And then I bought a TAC Professional, which I still wish I had. I mean, that was a machine. And it, it played anything. You know, you could put gum on the Rathem thing and it would <laughs> still play. But. The first thing I noticed, and, and I had at that point I'm demonstrating products at, at CES, digital just wasn't as intense. Mm. When I put the LP right, when I put the Eric down, I mean, I always cleaned the needle, you know, and you could hear the, with the volume up right. so you could hear it. I actually believed in the 90s that I could tell how good the record or the cartridge was by just listening to how it sounds when I ran the yeah, brush across. Yeah, people used to say it. that about when the stylist hits the record. Right. Like that. That incident, Absolutely. you can tell a lot. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it sets the brain up. It triggers it. It's like somebody's whispering the right word in your ear, you know? But you know what I think is even more telling? Is how 
uh, clicks and pops on records sound with one cartridge or one turntable to the next. Because sometimes they're instantaneous, they just go by really fast, and sometimes it's more like thud, 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 you know? So there's like a range of how cartridges and systems track the sound of clicks and pops. And by the way, I know that that's the reason that a lot of people leave vinyl because it bugs them. But my experience is with really good turntables, good arm cartridge, that well, the record surface noise is still there, but it recedes into the background so it's less in your face and you can listen to it and barely even notice that it's happening. So, but it, vinyl is not for everyone. I never thought it was once digital took hold. So I'm not trying to convince anybody. Unless you're open-minded and you're vinyl curious and you do want to now in 2023 you know, take a chance and get into vinyl, do it. You should have that experience. And maybe you'll do it and think this is wonderful, or you'll do it and you'll say, nah, digital's better for me. And both, uh, both are acceptable, absolutely. I think we're going to wind this thing down. So anyway, sixth anniversary show. Thank you, everybody who's out there watching. Thank you. If you've ever watched this show over the past six years, I can't thank you enough. Again, thanks to all my patrons for the support for at least the last five years. It's been great. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, what comes next because as much as I can plan, you know, the future of this channel, I don't really know. I'm trying to make it better. I'm trying to change things. I have a new opening that no one has actually commented on me as you go into a regular video. It's a different one now. I like it. But anyway, I mix them up, the opening sequences anyway. So again, Thank you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Herb, because doing these things with Herb, this is the first live stream, as you can tell, with Herb. And uh, it's, it's I love it. I wish I could read the thing. But Maybe I want to point always out. Do it. I want, Maybe we should always do these as live streams. I, if you, hey, you're the boss, man. Okay. I want to point out, though, that when we first started, I, I, this morning I woke up because I knew I was coming here, so I went and watched those early videos, the first ones, the first five or six. And I remember talking to you on the phone about them. Uh -huh. And I, it, it was a big deal. I, I doubt the viewers ever grasped what a big deal <laughs> it was. Change of life kind of thing, right. you know. Uh, it's, I can't even imagine after six years. I can't, I couldn't tell you where this would be six months from now. Mm -hmm. It evolves. And that's the beauty of it. And right. I think... That's kind of the beauty of all these little bits and pieces that we're, we're, you know, jabbering about, is they evolve. I mean, I just find myself kind of going back a little bit and then leaping forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, any kind of video reviewing has to kind of, it behooves it to anchor it in the past, but project it into the future a little bit. Like where Steve's gonna be at Christmas time. I couldn't tell you, man, but it'll be different. <laughs> right. I never thought I'd see him with horns or, or, or panel speakers or b open baffle. Hey, you know, you know what I have? This is looking more like it's really going to happen. I'm going to do this all Dynaco system. Dynaco speakers, Dynaco amp, Dynaco preamp. Vintage. Vintage, yeah. Tube. From the 50s and 60s. Hopefully, in the, well, I'm going to get it in the middle of September, I think. You know, until it's here, it's it's always a question mark. But it looks like it's really happening, and I am excited to do that. I owned a Dynaco Stereo 70, you know, 30 years I ago. I still or something. do. And, yeah, anyway, I had one, um, but I, was, I, was, I wasn't a reviewer, but I was really churning through stuff really fast even then. So I had a, a Stereo 70 just because of curiosity. So maybe I had it four or five months. But... Uh, I think my approach this time, especially since it's Dynaco speakers and the amp and the preamp, hearing it as people heard it back in the day, um, will be really, really interesting. I'm predicting OTL <laughs> in the next year or two. Well, I, you know, I have the. Anywho. Anyway, any last uh, comments there we should react to? Not enough DAC discussion. <laughs> you can have my blown up Dynaco stuff. <laughs> oh. Anyway, guys. Have you considered getting a Lala? Bye bye from France. Bye bye oh, from bye New York. France. Bye bye. Bye bye from New York. Thank you so Thank you much, guys. guys. It's fantastic. It's an honor to be here. In front and of you guys. Uh, we'll do it again. We definitely will. Hopefully, we'll figure out how to start it on time. 
But anyway. I bet he can't turn it off any right, better than I, he can I turn it right. on. The turning off is almost as hard as turning <laughs> on. But I think we hit this little thingy here. Maybe not. I'm sure that's not it. You think that's not it, huh? We'll get there. Yes. Oh.